It's 10 o'clock. This is Sky News at 10, our top story. At least six people dead, more than 50 rescued as a migrant boat sinks in the channel. 22 survivors brought to Dover following an operation involving the French Navy and the UK Coast Guard. Also tonight, barge backlash. Ministers accused of startling incompetence after migrants were moved off the Bibby Stockholm due to disease fears. Residents returned to the Hawaiian town, devastated by wildfires, which killed at least 80 people. While it's not clear what the cause of these fires was, what is apparent is that they grew so colossally and moved so quickly that some people didn't have time to escape. The Lionesses beat Colombia to set up a World Cup semi-final against Australia. A losing start for Harry Kane at Bayern Munich as he gets straight down to business following his move from Spurs. And we'll take a first look at tomorrow's front pages in the press preview from 10.30. Good evening, thanks for joining us. At least six people have died after a migrant boat sank in the channel. More than 50 people were rescued, but French authorities believe two people could still be missing. The boat got into difficulty just off the coast of Sangat in northern France in the early hours of this morning. Five French ships, two British vessels and a helicopter were all involved in the rescue. Our Europe correspondent Adam Parsons reports from Calais. In northern France, the echo of awful death once again lingers over these beaches. In the darkness of the early morning, a boat laden with migrants overturned near this coast. Dozens were rescued, but not all. The Channel has claimed more victims. The French maritime minister came to Calais to support his emergency services. He said those who died had been victims of callous criminals. When we spoke, I put it to him that some in Britain think the French aren't doing enough to stop the flow of small boats. The French government is doing a lot. We intensified our uh, effort, we intensified the presence of our vessel. That's why we had four vessels in a few minutes that were uh, on the sea and managed to save and to rescue life. So what we are doing is saving life. That's our first priority. Among those he spoke to were the crew of the local lifeboat. These men recovered five bodies from the water. When we arrived, we could only see large amounts of water. It was the helicopter which guided us to find the bodies. And then we had to recover the bodies, one after another. Normality does return quickly to these beaches. People here learn how to live with the spectre of migration. Well, this is the beach in Songat in northern France, and right now it looks like a playground for kite surfers. But over the years, tens of thousands of people have set off from here in small boats heading towards Britain, and the boat that sank was just a few miles out at sea from where I'm standing. And this tragedy is probably a demonstration of two things. Firstly, the perils of making that journey, but secondly, the determination of so many people to still try to get from here to Britain over there. Sky News has witnessed this danger close up. Chaotic scenes of people clambering through the sea and onto these flimsy, overcrowded boats. But people do this journey for one reason, because they are desperate to get to Britain. Some of those rescued here were helped by a British lifeboat, which landed them in England. They arrived exhausted and having been witnesses to tragedy. That is an awful price to pay for crossing the channel. Adam Parsons, Sky News, Calais. Well, Sky's Adele Robinson is in Dover for us tonight. Adele, what more do we know about both the victims and indeed the survivors? Well, from the British perspective, we know that 22 survivors were brought ashore here to Dover uh, this morning and into this afternoon, and they were processed uh, at a centre just not far from us, over the other side uh, from where I'm standing now. And then we saw two coach loads 
uh, leaving. Actually, one coach was full. Uh, Ish, and then the other one only probably had about five or six people on it. So uh, it could have been that most of them were survivors and some were from other rescues, but we uh, assume that most of them were from that coordinated search and rescue uh, operation that was out in the channel in the early hours of this morning. It marks a tragic end to the government's so-called small boats week, which saw a push of announcements intending to show that the government was taking action on its pledge to stop the boats. From a political perspective, it's been a bad week, um, not to mention the Bibby Stockholm uh, barge fiasco, but also the, also the statistics that were released this week showing that the number of migrants and refugees who have made the crossing from northern France to Britain since 2018 has now surpassed 100 now, those deaths in, those tragic deaths in the Channel today, uh, they serve as a reminder, a stark reminder of the risks that people are willing to take and the human cost of those journeys across the waves here to British shores. Now, the, the government has been trying to strike the right balance with this, with compassionate words on one side and, and on the other, a, a reiteration of their message that they are still trying to prevent these crossings. They're trying to... Um, change the asylum system as, uh, as, a, as a, a pull factor. They want it to be a deterrent. But what we are seeing is that's not working. And as a result, there have been renewed calls by various charities and organisations after, in the wake of the tragedy today, including from the PCS Union, which wants to see an alternative approach put in place, what it calls the safer passage policy, which would uh, see qualifying individuals being able to safely travel to the UK and have their asylum claims uh, processed. In a damning statement, they have criticised the government, saying that they have actually got blood on their hands. Uh, and they've also said that they are pouring taxpayers' money down the drain with unlawful and unworkable policies. Similar sentiment from the Refugee Council and the Shadow Immigration Minister, who describes gimmicks and madcap schemes. What we're left with, though, after a tragedy like this is two sides to the story, a political one and a human one. I think what unites all parties is that no one wants to see these dangerous crossings taken place, but they are, and in great numbers. It, it leaves that big question as to whether the government's plans to reduce those pull factors will even serve as a deterrent uh, to these migrants and refugees, when, as we've seen today, they are not deterred by the very risk of death out there in the Channel. OK, Adele in Dover, thank you. Meanwhile, Conservative MPs have accused ministers of startling incompetence after migrants were removed, as Adele was saying, from the Bibby Stockholm barge because Legionella bacteria was found in the water supply. Those on board were sent a letter telling them why they were being moved. But that was hours after Sky News broke the story yesterday and they weren't told to stop drinking the water. As Laura Bundock reports... The barge lies dormant, but criticism around its evacuation continues. The 39 asylum seekers who'd only arrived last week now housed elsewhere, some two hours away. Sky News understands this is the letter they were given, informing them the Legionella bacteria had been found. It lists symptoms and offers tests if people are unwell. Local volunteers are helping them. Heather is in touch with 10 of the group. I got a message to say um, that when they arrived, the rooms were unclean and the sheets hadn't been, um, and the sheets were dirty. She says they're tired and traumatised. A lot of them feel that their safety isn't being taken as a priority. Um, a lot of them heard about the fire concerns and now they're hearing about the water. Um, and they really feel like they're not being valued as humans. In a statement, a Home Office spokesperson said the health and welfare of asylum seekers remains of the utmost priority. The Home Office and our contractors are following all protocol and advice from Dorset Council's Environmental Health Team, UK Health Security Agency and Dorset NHS, who we are working closely with. The Bibby Stockholm was supposed to showcase the government's immigration plan. They wanted to prove they'd got a grip, but critics say they're failing. The shadow immigration minister has written to his counterpart, Robert Jenrick, 
and his concerns are echoed by the local Labour mayor. I'm, I'm absolutely shocked to see that the Home Office, with its thousands of employees and its resources, has failed in some of the most basic, basic checks. We don't know when people will return to the Bibby Barge, but every day's delay adds to the fierce criticism, not just from opposition parties, but Tory backbenchers too. For now, what was meant to be a solution has highlighted political division and huge practical problems. Laura Bundock, Sky News, Portland. The death toll in Hawaii following devastating wildfires has continued to rise. So far, 80 people are known to have died. Hundreds more are still missing as search and rescue operations continue. Approximately 1,000 buildings have been destroyed by the fires and it's understood that emergency sirens, which were supposed to warn residents of the fires, never went off. Well, the fires ripped through the Hawaiian island of Maui, which left the historic town of Lahaina on the island's west coast worst affected. From there, Sky's US correspondent Martha Kellner sent this report. It was the first time the people of Lahaina had been permitted to return to their homes since wildfires tore through here. What awaited them was worse than many even imagined. A fire hot enough to turn metal to molten lava. Decades of history, now dust. Sisters Christy and Abigail lived here with 18 members of their family in a house built by their dad. How did it feel when you first saw it? So <laughs> surreal, like, sick. Like, it just looked like a, a... I don't even know how to explain it. Like a, it's like, the, it's like a war zone and you're just like, <laughs> you don't even know how to feel. We lost everything. You know, thank God that like we still have each other and we're all alive and safe and counted for. It's like we're the only things we have now because everything that we had in the past is gone. Three days after the fires hit, the US Army go from house to house. An X marks a completed search, with many hundreds still missing. This is now a recovery operation. It's not yet clear what started these fires, but what is apparent is that they grew so colossally and moved so quickly that some people simply could not outrun the flames, abandoning their cars here and jumping into the ocean. Authorities say up to 100 people entered the sea. They clung to each other in the waves, embers flying above. Many here say they didn't realise how serious the fire was until the flames were upon them. I hear there no sirens went off, nothing, nothing. We just had to know that ourselves, it was fight or flight mm -hmm. with no warning whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And it spread in the matter of minutes. Maui does have an outdoor emergency alert system specifically designed for this sort of scenario. But for whatever reason, on Tuesday afternoon, it wasn't activated. On Lahaina's main street, this is what's left of the art gallery. A row of shops and restaurants and a popular bar owned by Rocker Mick Fleetwood, now a shell. I used to cook gelato on that. Oh, yeah. Natalie and her friends have returned to see the devastation for themselves. Everyone who came here, it was their happy place, and now everything we knew can't go to the gelato shop anymore, can't go to the ABC stores, can't go to the bars we used to go to. There was bingo nights and trivia nights and such a big sense of community. And although we still have that sense of community, it's not going to be the same for a while. A queue of cars hours long waited on the main highway into Lahaina. But authorities suddenly shut access once more to the western part of the island. Another fire had broken out, they said. More uncertainty and fear for a community which has already endured so much. Well, Martha joins us uh, now from Maui. As we saw in your report, Martha, people have lost absolutely everything. What help are they getting? 
Yeah, complete destruction there, Jonathan. And you saw at the end of that report that uh, those massive, endless line of cars waiting to get access back into Lahaina. Some people slept in their cars overnight for 15 hours, only to be told by authorities this morning that that highway would be shut once again. The town of Lahaina and the surrounding areas completely cut off. Uh, I've just been speaking to a lady from an organisation which is delivering supplies to some of those cut-off areas via boat. And she says uh, the lack of consistency in that highway into Lahaina, the lack of access by, by road, is a major problem. She says there are people in Lahaina who need to get out to get to the other side of the island to get medicine, but they're too scared to leave for fear that they won't be able to get back in. Uh, I'll just give you the latest figures from the county of Maui in terms of the level of destruction. 2,200 buildings damaged or destroyed. The estimated cost of rebuilding the affected parts of Maui already over $5.5 billion. 4,500 people as of this morning still without electricity. Residents in Western Maui being warned that their water supply may well be contaminated. So it's a very, very miserable, grim situation over there as the search uh, through the wreckage continues. 80 people confirmed to have died in this disaster. And uh, the, the previous most deadly wildfire in the US was the town of Paradise in California, in which 85 people died. At that point, it was the deadliest US wildfire for a century. There is every chance that this could well sadly surpass that. Serious questions then for authorities about just why these fires were so deadly. What I'm hearing time and again from people is complaints that they simply did not have enough warning to escape. Truly desperate. Uh, Martha, thank you. On to some good news now. The Lionesses have booked their place in the World Cup semi-finals with a 2-1 win against Colombia. England came from behind in a nail-biting quarter-final and will now face tournament hosts Australia on Wednesday morning. From Sydney, our sports correspondent Rob Harris reports. England, England, England! They never doubted England could do it, even in this World Cup of upsets. But overcoming the lowest ranked team remaining tested the Lionesses to the limit. Their attacking instinct had been rediscovered in the quarterfinals. Alessia Russo with an early header. But Colombia's creativity caused them problems, particularly from Linda Casado. The team sensation a handful for England's defence. Setting up the opener when Lessi Santos chipped Mary Earps. However, intended, it found the net. But Colombia's goalkeeper had a moment to forget as well. Fumbling the ball and Lauren Hemp taking advantage. England were fortunate to be level, but they were back in it. And back out for the second half energised. Going in front with a clinical finish from Russo in the 63rd minute. A lead that was protected by Earps producing a one-handed save. And England held on to win 2-1. You're in those moments a lot as a striker and it's kind of what you train for. Um, you have a, a split second to take a shot and I knew I wanted to go across the goalkeeper with as much pace as I could and fortunately enough it went in. So, um, yeah, just buzzing to be in the semis now. It required a lot of resilience on a tough night for England, but they're in a third consecutive Women's World Cup semi-final. They'll be back here on Wednesday night to play Australia after the co-host knocked out France. We have had such a warm welcome here and we're really enjoying our time here in Australia. And um, I actually really like the people here, but that doesn't mean there's no rivalry. So we'll see that Wednesday. It was a tense penalty shootout that settled the day's other quarter-final. Australia prevailing 7-6. The biggest moment in Australian football history, reaching their first global semi-final. England did amazing, we're so happy. So England Australia semi-final, we can't wait. We've just got tickets. We literally just put tickets on the steps of that stadium when I put yeah. tickets for all of us, we're all going. We're all going. This is coming home. It's coming home. There's still a semi-final to be won. But winning the Euros last year has given the Lionesses and their fans belief that football's biggest prize can be brought home. Rob Harris, Sky News, Sydney. 
all very exciting. Now, officials in Pakistan have opened an investigation into the death of a porter on K2. Video emerged yesterday, appearing to show mountaineers stepping over Mohammed Hassan after he was seriously injured last month. Norwegian climber Kristin Harilla has denied claims that her team could have done more to save him. A scientist who worked on the government's response to the COVID pandemic has died in a bike crash in Italy. Susanna Bodhi, led health data scientist at number 10, was killed with, uh, while cycling on a path near Lake Garda this morning. Danny Street described her as an incredible scientist and a loved and admired colleague and friend. Moscow says it has thwarted an attempted attack on the Kerch Bridge linking Crimea to Russia. Plumes of smoke were seen rising near the bridge earlier and Russia says it brought down two Ukrainian rockets. Ukraine hasn't commented. Sky News has learned that the owner of the Daily Mail is in talks with potential backers for a bid for the Daily Telegraph. Lord Rothmere is courting Middle East investment funds to help him realise his ambition of uniting the newspapers under his ownership. Lloyd's, which owns Telegraph newspapers, values them at around £600 million. Now, Harry Kane got straight down to business at Bayern Munich this evening, making his debut just hours after his transfer from Spurs was confirmed. The England captain came on as a substitute in the German Super Cup against RB Leipzig, but it was a disappointing start for Kane and his teammates as they were beaten 3 0. Lisa Dowd reports. He's still in a white shirt, but he's now Bayern Munich's star turn. Harry Kane came on as a sub in the German Super Cup, having made the biggest decision of his career. And it was quite the entrance for the England and Tottenham legend, now very much in the spotlight. And action. His new club were keen to show off their record signing straight away. He's moved in search of trophies. For all the goal-scoring records at Tottenham, he'd never won silverware with the London club. FC Bayern Munich are one of the biggest clubs in the world and I've always said throughout my career I want to keep improving and keep pushing myself to, to be the very best and uh, I felt like it was the right step in my career to, to really push myself and test myself on the highest level. So uh, that's why I'm here and I look forward to that challenge. The brilliance of Harry Kane. Kane started at Tottenham aged just 11 and became one of the greatest players to pull on a Spurs shirt. He posted a message to fans. And most importantly, a thank you to you, the Tottenham fans. Um, from the moment I've been playing, I've been one of your own, uh, and I've given everything that I possibly could to, to make you proud. Supporters say the club should have done more to keep him. Tottenham had a generational talent, a man that had all the ability in the world to help them go for titles, go for FA Cups, go for Champions Leagues when they were in the Champions League and ultimately fail to build around him. And that's something I know me and many, many Spurs fans fail to accept. The deal is worth nearly £100 million, a Bundesliga record. Bayern believed that Harry Kane might be the missing link that gives them enough firepower to challenge for their seventh European Cup. And, of course, he is somebody who hasn't been able to win silverware with the team yet. And I think at Bayern, you know, the domestic trophies are always very much within reach. They're dominating the league. RB Leipzig were already ahead when Kane came on and won 3-0. Not the dream start, but Bayern know they have one of the world's most prolific strikers. The goals will come. Lisa Dowd, Sky News. And let's get more sport now with Damesh. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. There are over 130,000 people living with multiple sclerosis in the UK, and I'm one of them. I knew I had MS at 17, but it's only recently that I shared my story with the world. I'm not going to let MS stop me from achieving my dreams. I want to find out the truth about this condition and what it means for people living with it. I'm Lena Nilsson and this is my story. Athletics was my first love. I was fascinated with running since the age of 11. 
I was advised to stop training after receiving my diagnosis in case it made my condition worse. At that time, it felt like a life sentence. But why do we always think of the worst at times like this? I'm on a mission to change the narrative. My family are my rock, and I know they'll always be there for me. What was I like as a child? I don't even remember. Um, she was talking too much. <laughs> <laughs> Asking everybody in the street, hello, what's your name? I remember when you, your first time had that attack, you was sleeping and it was eight o'clock and I, I was down the stairs and I called, love you, get ready to go to school. Yeah. And she told me, Lena, she cannot get up from the bed. And you told me you cannot move your arm and you cannot move your hand. I was very worried and I said, maybe, you know, this is like you become paralyzed or something. Guess I don't know, you yeah. know, something happened, you know. I think because initially we thought it was a stroke. That's what your first thought was, wasn't it? That yeah, because it, it was affected, a stroke. it was my left arm that yeah. was weak, so that's associated with a stroke, so yeah, a few of the doctors said that. So not too long after that was when I received the diagnosis and mum, you were with me in the doctor's office when we received the diagnosis that I had MS, multiple sclerosis. Did you know what it was? Uh, no, until I searched in Google just to see, you know, why that has come to the people and which kind of that disease and what the treatment you're going to take it and, you know, all that things that also make me very worried. But, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to keep not, not to show you that my worries or what I'm scared of and, you know, and I'm really very proud of you because I, I asked you to stop and, and you refused to stop and, and I encourage you to do what you want to do. Last year, I told the world that I had MS after almost a decade of keeping it private. One of the early people to know was my twin sister, Lavia. When I first told you about my diagnosis, do you remember when, when it was? Yeah, vaguely, it was in the back of a car. And <laughs> I think the words you used were, do you even know what I have? And I was like, no, you didn't tell me. And then you're like, I had multiple sclerosis. And I was like, what's that? <laughs> and it was, um, I think it was just a confusing time because I'd heard it sort of like floating around, but I didn't quite understand how a 17 year old would have yeah. MS. And I remember telling you, because the doctors were like to me, oh, um, your twin sister is going to be at a higher chance of getting it. And I was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> you're not only my twin sister, you're my best friend. Um, do you remember kind of supporting me through any of those relapses that I had, like how you helped me get, get through some of those? Yeah, I think initially, like, because I didn't know what it was, I went onto Google to search up the disease and it said that you might end up in a wheelchair and I didn't really know what to think of that. And then you told me that there are different types of MS. Yeah, and, and I got diagnosed with relapsing and remitting MS. So let's take it back to my most recent relapse um, in Oregon, the World Championships. Uh, you knew straight away that something was wrong, didn't you? Yeah, it was your first World Championships and you'd worked so hard to get there. And I remember you woke, you woke up, I think it was two days before your heats, and mm. I immediately sensed that something was wrong in the room. Initially, I thought maybe it was nerves, but then when you said, you couldn't feel your torso. That was, it brought back all those memories of being 17 and not really knowing what was happening. And that was, that was really scary. I've had a lot of time to think since my diagnosis. Now it was time to try. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Domesh, thank you. That was Sky News at 10. Coming up, we're going to take a first look at Sunday's papers. It's the press preview, of course. Uh, looking at this story, on the front of the Sunday Express, for pity's sake, stop the boats. And tonight I'll be joined by the journalist and author Christina Patterson and also former number 10 speechwriter Asa Bennett. We'll be chatting to them about all of uh, today's stories and tomorrow's headlines in a couple of minutes. I'm Mark Stone and I'm Sky's correspondent based here in Washington, D.C. Oh, street. Oh, street. Well, the plan seems to be to head to the police station where the policeman who fired the shots was based. And everything you know is memories is all gone. In almost every corner, this town has been completely destroyed by the fire. I've witnessed the remarkable passion for politics here, but the anger too. We have to get Trump out of the White House. Is this the moment to reform gun laws? You know, it's, it's easy to go to politics. But it's important. It's at the heart of the issue. I, I get that that's where the media likes to go. No, it's not. It's where many of the people we've talked to here like to go. 
I report on the biggest stories from around the world. This is a town that is effectively encircled by the Russians. You say it's all fabrication, what's happening in Butcher? Destroyed my nation. We take you to the heart of stories that shape our planet. Oh, what fun! Yeah, I can hear now quite a few explosions uh, in the distance here in Jerusalem. A very violent series of confrontations here. What do you think of ISIS? Everybody here know the truth of ISIS. Hello again, you're watching Sky News. We've got the press preview for you in a moment, of course, looking at Sunday's front pages. But first, our top stories. At least six people have died after a migrant boat capsized off the French coast. 80 people are now known to have died in wildfires in Hawaii. And the Lionesses have booked their place in the World Cup semi-finals. They'll face hosts Australia on Wednesday. Good evening. Time for the press preview then. It's a uh, first chance to check out Sunday's front pages. And tonight we'll have a look at them with the journalist and author Christina Patterson, who's joined by the former number 10 speechwriter Asa Bennett. Great to see you both this Saturday evening. We'll chat in a moment after we've had a look at uh, those front pages for you. We're going to begin with the Sunday Express, leading with the headline, For pity's sake, stop the boats, after six people died after they tried to cross the channel. Well, the Mirror has the same story, writing, how many more must die before the Tories get a grip, also reflecting on the uh, tragic channel deaths. Here's the Sunday People, also reporting on the tragedy, with an image of the survivors being taken to shore on its front cover. The Observer says today's deaths have prompted fresh anger towards the government and its controversial asylum policy. And the Sunday Telegraph says the government might start housing asylum seekers in offices and student accommodation blocks. Elsewhere, the Sunday Times leads on calls for tougher A-level grading to halt the surge in students dropping out of university. And the Daily Star claims scientists have come up with a new idea to contact aliens by inviting them to play chess. And just to remind you, you can scan the QR code that you see on screen during the programme. Uh, check out the front pages 
of the papers while you're watching us discuss them. And to do that, Christina Patterson and Asa Bennett. Uh, lovely to see you both this uh, Saturday evening. Um, lots to talk about. Uh, the awful events in the channel, Christina, uh, dominating the front pages. Uh, and interesting to see um, uh, the front of the Express, for pity's sake, stop the boats. Different papers coming up with uh, different solutions, I guess, uh, whether it's the Telegraph talking about increasing the deterrent or it's the Observer talking about improving the means of getting here legally um, or, or maybe it's a bit of both, but whatever uh, it is, there needs to be a solution soon. There does need to be a solution soon, but uh, it's not the easiest thing to find a solution for. It really has been a disastrous week for the Tories in terms of their so-called stop the boat policies and an absolutely tragic end to it. But I think really the fact that they are trying to make this a kind of electoral issue and, and also a culture war issue, it's very depressing and very upsetting and here we see the reality of it people who have lost their lives because it's a very complex issue and by pretending that it can be solved by this policy or that policy it doesn't do justice to the complexity of, of the issue it is true that there are not currently many legal routes into the uk there are for ukrainians and there are for people from hong kong but certainly for most people in the world who are escaping war or disaster there are not currently legal routes uh, so you know that is an issue but we can't pretend that we can offer asylum to everybody in the whole world who is eligible for it. It's just not practical. And the, the reality is that these people are not getting, they can't kind of manufacture a boat and make it here on their own. They're getting here because of people smugglers who are utterly amoral, who are perfectly happy to see them die, taking their money and offering them boats that are likely to sink. And as we have seen tragically today, do think, relying on uh, uh, people in both France and the UK to rescue them. What we need to do is to break the people smugglers' gangs. That's the key thing that needs to happen here. And offering endless amounts of more accommodation, deterrence or whatever is just not going to solve the problem. But it also has to be said that there is an enormous backlog. And the reason we have so many people who have to be housed at the expense of the British, at the cost to the British taxpayer, is because we have this enormous backlog. So this is an issue of enormous incompetence from the government. But it is also true that there aren't simple problems, simple solutions to it. And it, and I, and it makes me mm. angry when people pretend there are. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, front of the mirror, Asa, how many more must die before Tories get a grip? A picture there of the, the lifeboat that was involved in that uh, uh, dawn rescue. Um, I mean, what are, you, what are your thoughts on this? It's, it's, it's just almost impossible mm. to come up with a solution to this, isn't it? And it has become so politicised. Well, certainly what's very striking is how this issue, in many ways, actually across, it, it cuts across party lines, because you have there the Express and the Mirror, both newspapers with very different uh, you know, political wings that they would sort of lean towards. And both of them are then shining a light on this and saying, you know, this cannot go on, something must be done. Of course, as you're saying, the real just debate is what is that something? Um, you know, we've seen this is you know, the government's view. This is their stop the boats week when they really show that they've got a grip of the issue. Um, and yet there's also a poll we've seen showing that only one in 10 of those surveyed among the electorate think that the government really is succeeding in trying to turn the tide here. And it really is striking when you see the scale of human tragedy like this. You know, as Christina was talking about, you know, the, the people, these innocent people are basically victims of criminal smuggling gangs who are then trying to offer them, you know, the hope of salvation, but admittedly on ramshackle death traps. Um, and as a result, you know, they're almost engineering humanitarian crises on our doorstop. Um, and so that's why the government's trying to work overtime to try and stop, you know, to try and destroy the deterrent, to, to apply deterrent, to destroy the incentive and to destroy the business model. Um, but then, as you can see, these measures are all have their own complications with the baby Stockholm having a sort of outbreak of Legionnaires disease and what led seemingly bacteria infested waters, um, you know, instead of trying to get more barges in. You know, the challenge goes on, basically.
Yeah, well, let's talk about that next, shall we? Because it's uh, on the front of the Sunday Telegraph. Ministers want more barges, Christina, for asylum uh, seekers. We saw those 39, uh, I think it was, migrants on board the barge in, in Dorset having to be removed because of, uh, of uh, Legionella, as, uh, as Asa was saying. Um, are more barges the solution? Clearly not. I mean, they can't even make one barge work. You know, they, I mean, that, this week has been a total farce. They finally got 39 people on that barge, and the minute they get them on, they have to wheel them off because of the threat of legionnaires. So barges are clearly not the answer. I mean, as I said before, it, one of the central answers has to be to speed up the, the processing. Um, the fact that people are waiting many months to get their paperwork considered is ridiculous and they've enormously increased the number of staff in the home office so i don't understand why it's taking so long for this but you know, why there's such mass incompetence here but barges are clearly not the answer well are they I, not I are they not the, i mean sorry christine to 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 uh, mm -hmm. to interrupt but if it, i mean the legion as thing obviously is a, is a is a nightmare but if it, if it wasn't for that are they really not the answer or, or are they quite a sensible solution <laughs> rather than spending millions a week on hotels no, I, I don't. I don't. I'm not saying that it's wrong to put them on barges. I'm saying okay. that they're not the answer. Um, I think it is. I think it's absolutely crazy that the British taxpayer is putting asylum seekers in inexpensive hotels, and as some politicians have said, hotels that most people couldn't afford to pay in to stay in themselves. So I'm. I'm. I don't disapprove of asylum seekers being put in pretty basic accommodation. There is talk of using um, former student accommodation, um, all kinds of, uh, you know, office blocks even. That's, as, as long as it's safe accommodation without Legionnaire's bacteria and with, you know, food and, uh, and bathroom accommodation, I think that's fine. But none of these things are the answer. The answer is to solve the problem, is to hit the people smugglers, it's to get the, the whole processing under control, it's to form proper agreements with France, it's to get the policing, to get the, the coast policed in both the UK and in France. It's not to keep expanding enormous swathes of accommodation. That's clearly not going to, you know, it's just going to increase the number of people coming over here if they think there's limitless accommodation to put them up. Yeah, it's interesting, Asa, the, uh, the Shadow Immigration mm. Minister today talking about um, uh, the barges being w one of a number of gimmicky madcap schemes by the government. But do, do you feel that Labour have got a handle on this? You know, we're approaching a, a general election in the not-too-distant future. Where does Labour stand on all of this? How they could um, solve the problem? I'm afraid we, we, you know, Labour as the opposition, you'd expect them to criticise, yes, but then they, the government's natural repost will be, well, where are your ideas? And they, they're being rather shy at the moment because they're obviously trapped between two sort of poles. And on the one hand, there's parts of their party that would want them to go full throttle in opening safe and more safe and legal routes. Um, but then the argument can be that you're just encouraging more people to come in and apply for asylum and, you know, to, uh, and then of course, any the others who understand, you know, you know a post-Brexit Britain, you do need to try and show control over migration. You do need to try and have the work as the government's doing, in which you work with the French to try and have more people, you know, stay in Europe or the first country they land rather than going on to Britain. Um, you know, and just generally show that element of grip. Um, and so they try and see that Labour cannot go soft on this. So that's why they really are, you know, stuck on the fence over this issue. OK, uh, we shall talk more in a moment. Thank you for that. Uh, coming up, more from the front pages, including this story that's on the front of The Telegraph, reporting on Labour's scrapping of their commitment to roll out ULEZ zones across the country. Uh, chatting about that and more after this short break. I think it's astonishing. I think this new study is highlighting the extreme conditions that we've seen in Antarctica in recent years. We've seen the la Earth's largest heat wave ever at almost 40 degrees above normal, record low sea ice conditions, the disintegration of huge ice shelves in just a matter of days, and the crash of populations of native species. And what's most concerning is these extreme events are becoming more and more frequent, a new normal, if you would, 
as the Earth continues to warm with massive consequences for the rest of the world. The science is very strong, so in terms of the warming trend, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is unequivocal that humans have warmed the Earth and are causing climate change. And because Antarctica is so remote and difficult to work in, it's taking us longer to establish these trends, but we are continuing to work on this. And actually, the, for example, this year, there was no sea ice around Antarctica in the summer, and this made accessing the ice sheet almost easier in a tragic way, allowing us to get measurements right at the front of the ice at the interface where the action is happening. So I was in a ship less than 2,000 kilometers from the South Pole, but it looked more like I was in the middle of the Atlantic. It was completely stunning. Hundreds of square kilometers of open ocean surrounded the main ice sheet, soaking in all of the sun's heat, and that will accelerate the melting of the main ice sheet as those warm waters erode it from beneath. We're looking potentially, because Antarctica and Greenland are tracking the worst possible case IPCC climate change scenario trackers right now, we're looking at potentially a meter of sea level rise by the end of this century, but that's only the beginning, and then the rate will accelerate and really take off. So we're potentially looking at multiple meters of sea level rise in the coming centuries, and policymakers need to wake up and realize that the consequences of not acting today will continue to haunt us for decades or even centuries to come. Much more difficult to reverse the changes, so we're approaching these tipping points, and once they are crossed, we'll have to cool the earth significantly, several degrees less than pre-industrial, so before 150 years ago. And we've already warmed it by 1.2 degrees, we're heading rapidly towards 1.5, so the window for stopping us from crossing these tipping points is rapidly closing. Uh, welcome back to the press preview. Christina and Asa are still with me. Uh, let's have a look at the front of the Observer, Christina. Great photo there, actually. Um, Alex Greenwood, uh, the, uh, the Lioness player, consoling uh, one of Columbia's team after um, that uh, fantastic victory. I don't know if you saw the game. The last few minutes were nail-biting, weren't they, when they went into extra time? I'm afraid I didn't see the game. I'm, I'm with some people who are big supporters. A friend of mine has been watching every game so far. But um, I found this photo really moving, actually. I think I find the, the women, the, the lionesses, extremely inspirational women. The, the efforts they must have had to make to get to where they are in a country where women's football has not had huge funding poured into it and boy have they been able to show the men how to do it they've shown male football players how to win which has been fantastic but this particular photo of of compassion and support for that Colombian player after they lost after the team lost I thought was just very very touching so I mean the whole thing is cheering and it's one of the I have to say one of the few things that has given me a free song of patriotic pride recently is is the lionesses so you know all hail to them yeah and uh, yeah. the next game the semi-final clash Acer is on Wednesday uh, where they're going to play the host Australia that is going to be uh, a tough match I mean, you were speaking about nail biting. You know, earlier. this is, in my view, the real nail biter to come because Australia, you know, yes, they're the hosts. And this summer, I mean, in terms of sport, we've seemed to have, like, let's put it this way. I want to cheer the rafters for the Lionesses. I want to hope that after the Euros, they will have nothing but success after success. Yeah, the Aussies, you know, 
in in netball they won the world cup for that this summer they also were winning the ashes this summer as well they've come over with the trophies time after time lately so i'm slightly worried about the you know what track record they may bring to the pitch this time Okay, all right. Let's uh, move on to uh, something completely different, ULEZ. Um, in fact, 8 to 1, you kick off uh, this for us. Sunday Telegraph, uh, Labour's going to drop its pledge to, uh, to roll out those ULEZ zones. Yes, bad news for Sally Khan. It seems that the uh, rowback continues after Uxbridge, in which it seemed very clear that uh, they did not like the idea of ULEZ expanding further and taxing more people around London. Um, and so much so that Labour, you know, Keir Starmer has said that he wants to uh, give the Tories the fewest chances possible to attack Labour policy. I think he basically put it to the party that if Labour policy is on Tory leaflets, you know, something's gone very wrong. And so the ULEZ is clearly candidate number one. Um, there's an interesting point Point that could be made, of course, if, if you are, you know, a Labour supporter, which is that well, you, you just might just slightly worry about how strong Mr. Starmer's convictions are. If effectively he's taking a kind of Groucho Marx approach to his uh, your policies of, you know, if you don't like these principles, I have others. Yeah, Christine, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I, I mean, green issues are coming to the fore a lot at the moment as we all uh, deal with the cost of living crisis because um, the burden um, that they can bring on people who are short of money is uh, pretty big, isn't it? And, and, and it doesn't seem that um, politicians quite yet are grasping that fact that if they want us all to be greener, then they need to help us with do it financially in, in a financial way. Well, I think that's exactly right. And I think that was the problem in the Uxbridge uh, by-election. And I think politicians haven't given enough thought to that. And although I applaud Sadiq Khan's efforts and in that they clearly have improved air quality in London and children, you know, will have much healthier lives as a result of them. There was that, that poor child who died of severe asthma, which was proven to be through air pollution some years ago. So clearly it's the right thing to do, but the issue is who pays? And at the moment, as with every other issue, it's the people who can afford at least to pay the highest price. And I think the thing is, I mean, I, I do agree that we don't, increasingly it seems we don't actually know what Keir Starmer does stand for in certain ways. But I also think he is absolutely clear that you can't do anything at all unless you win an election, which Labour has not seen the grasp for many, many years. And uh, so you can kind of work out some of what you're going to do later. But unless you're at the table or in the room, as, as you know, in, in the musical Hamilton, if you're not in the room where it happens, you can't make anything happen. And um, I think Labour clearly has much greener policies than the Tory party. And it has recently, as we know, um, Ben Goldsmith recently resigned because um, he claims he thinks that Rishi Sunak doesn't care about the environment at all. And I have to say, Rishi Sunak has given a very good impression of not caring at all about the environment. I think since COP, whatever it was, um, uh, I always forget the name of it, but the, the, you know, when we were making all those grand um, some statements about wanting to reach net zero, the government stance has been absolutely pathetic and they are rowing back on pretty much every target they have, have you know, set before now. So, Clearly, a Labour government is going to be more active on the environment than a Tory government. But you have to, as I think it says in this article, or as Labour have agreed, you have to step quite carefully and make sure that the people who don't mm. pay the most are the people who can afford it least. Mm. OK, all right. Well, listen, we've been talking a lot about uh, politicians and elections, and the Mail on Sunday has uh, an interesting article. They've done a State of the Nation poll, um, as, uh, uh, as would be expected, um, I guess, in terms of voting intention. Uh, Labour is uh, well ahead on 46 points compared to the Conservatives on 29. Um, but what is perhaps a bit more interesting uh, uh, is some of the, the, the other detail about Keir Starmer and uh, Rishi Sunak. For example, the question, do you imagine that Sunak or Starmer would be better for each of the following? And there's various uh, details here. Joining you for a night out, who would you prefer? Rishi Sunak gets 25% of the vote. Keir Starmer gets 33%. Asa, uh, going on a long journey, who mm. would you prefer to go with? Rishi Sunak, 24%. Keir Starmer, 34%. 
Well, look, I, I cite with the majority uh, on all these questions, two thirds of them clearly saying neither. Um, and it's particularly <laughs> clear when you see that, you know, let's put it this way if you want the fastest way to end the night out, bring one of them along. Um, that's clearly what the conclusions are from this. And you can see why it's a really furtive endorsement one way or the other. Seemingly, Keir Starmer will be best with your children if you want a babysitter. If you want Rishi Sunak to run a business, he, you know, if you want someone to run a business, he's your guy. Um, but no, I mean, the silent majority is very clear. I wish they were forcing people to make a choice, though, at least, because don't know is the easy, easiest option possible. Christina? Well, I, th I think that's absolutely right in terms of the majority not wanting. I think that people's heart would absolutely sink at the thought of a long car journey with, with either of them. But, um, but I do think, you know, we had the great entertainer and he made a terrible mess of the country. So I'm personally, I'm perfectly happy to have people in, start in, in charge now who are not a barrel of laughs, but are sort of vaguely competent. And unfortunately, the Tories under Rishi Sunak are not showing themselves to be particularly competent, although it has to be said that, I, that Rishi Sunak is a lot more competent than his predecessor and his predecessor's predecessor, though it's not saying a lot. And I, I suspect that Keir Starmer mm. will be pretty competent. He's a kind of solid, serious guy, but he will inherit such a terrible mess with this country that, okay. you know, he can't perform miracles. So no doubt he'll have masses to grapple with and probably not do very well at a lot of it. But at least I believe he will be trying to do his best and he will be getting good advice yeah. and going with some of the evidence, which yeah. is not something that's happened all that much in recent years. Yeah, certainly according to the Mail on Sunday, uh, Keir Starmer would be uh, more reliable feeding your cat when you're on holiday uh, than uh, Rishi Sunak. Thank you both very much. We'll chat again in half an hour. Coming up next, at least six people have died after a boat carrying migrants sank off the French coast. I'll have all the details for you in a couple of minutes.